He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, ko William Ray Aho, no mai ki te hibi pango. Welcome to Black Sheep. Scott Hamilton is a historian and author who's worked extensively in the Pacific. Back in 2013, he was teaching at a place called Atanisi. Which is a, a small and very strange university in Tonga. Atanisi is the Tongan word for Athens. And the founder of the school, the great Tongan intellectual Futahelu, he, uh, he was inspired by the Greeks. He thought, well, Socrates and his mates they used to sit round a, a wine bowl and talk about life. And uh, we'll sit round a kava bowl. It's been a mainstay of Tongan intellectual life for decades. And while he was teaching at Atanisi, Scott took his students on a field trip to the island of Eoa, which is a small mountainous island close to the main island of uh, Tonga, Tonga Tapu. We explored the island, uh, the flora and the fauna, tried to learn about the history. While he and his students were doing this, a young woman walked up to the group. She said her name was Pessy. Approached all of us and identified herself as a descendant of a, a people who'd lived on a, a small rocky island far to the south called Ata. And she said, we were stolen from our island by slavers, but no one will talk to me about it. My parents won't talk about it. I get teased at school. People say my ancestors were weak and that they were defeated by slavers. Some of them say that the woman on my ancestors' island were, were sold, sold to, to Palangi whalers. There's all sorts of nefarious gossip going around. And she said, I feel uh, whakama, which is a Tongan word, means sort of shame for being from Ata. And she said, I know you and your students, you have access to libraries, you have research tools that, that we don't have on the small island, and I wish I knew more about my island. And that really piqued my interest, and I began to uncover the story of Arta. What Scott uncovered was a tragedy. It's a very sad story, and it began to fascinate me. Scott Hamilton eventually published a short book on this story. It's called The Stolen Island, Searching for Arta. One of the first things he found in his research were accounts from European ethnologists who'd visited Atta in the early 1800s and recorded some details about the 300 or so people who lived there. A population that had been living remarkably successful on an inhospitable island for centuries and had developed a, a unique way of life to survive there, a, a way of life which involved uh, cultivating the small plateau at the top of the island's rocky cliffs, um, navigating the, the very rough waters around the island, trading with Europeans and Americans who came past in vessels, especially whaling vessels. And um, all of this was gone in a day. On that one day, in the first week of June, 1863, about half the island's population, some 150 people, were lured aboard a ship captained by a man called Thomas McGrath. Those 150 Atans were never seen again. Today's black sheep is the story of Thomas McGrath, how he and his crew destroyed a small civilization. Now, McGrath's a slightly dubious choice for black sheep. He wasn't a New Zealander, but he was sailing out of New Zealand when he launched the slave raid, and he recruited most of his crew in this country, and he's going to end up back in New Zealand later on in the story. For me, he's a compelling character. For me, he's a satanic character, but he's also a, a character who, who exemplifies uh, the tragedy of human history, the fact that... Um, a victim of injustice can himself uh, become a, a perpetrator of injustice. Just like a lot of people born to convict parents in Australia in the early 1800s, Thomas McGrath had a rough childhood. Thomas McGrath's father was 
an Irishman who was deported from Ireland. Uh, he was considered a rebel against Britain's very oppressive rule there. Thomas McGraw was born in Australia in 1816, and he was only young when his father was deported from Sydney to, I think, Port Macquarie in Tasmania uh, for criminal activity. For much of his childhood, he didn't have a father, grew up in poverty in Sydney. When Thomas was 15, he himself got in trouble with the law. He was convicted of helping to rob a warehouse. And he was sent to the penal colony of Hobart. So this is in 1831. And life down there was tough. We're talking about hard labour, inadequate rations. You've got a climate which is sometimes um, very, very harsh in the winter. Thomas McGrath incurred more punishments when he was in Hobart, um, living this miserable life as a, as a convict. He was caught, uh, for instance, with a sheep carcass. The sheep uh, that he was butchering was stolen. He got two more years hard labour for that, for stealing a sheep. But after that sentence was complete, Thomas McGrath managed to turn his life around. He married Elizabeth Foley on December 20th, 1840, and Elizabeth belonged to one of the wealthy ship-owning families in Hobart. And maybe it was thanks to those family connections that he started a career as a ship captain. Now Hobart was a real centre for the whaling trade at this time, and the whaling trade was at its absolute peak in the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, McGraw was able to get control of a whaling ship, and he became a successful whaler. I found it kind of surprising that the, you know, the daughter of a successful whaling family would, you know, marry a, a convict like McGrath. It is very mysterious, isn't it? What was the man charismatic? Uh, was he was he very good at what he did? Um, did he rise from a ship hand uh, to the position of captain just through merit? Um, we just don't know these things. However it happened, like Scott Hamilton said, McGrath became a successful whaling captain. It was dangerous work, sometimes deadly. To keep their spirits up, the whalers sang sea shanties as they worked. One of those songs was about the ships of the Weller Company, which sailed out from Wellington to deliver supplies to the exhausted whalers. Stuff like sugar and tea and rum, and if this is all sounding a bit familiar, it's cause that song suddenly went viral on TikTok in late 2020. I'll hit the water, the wheels till came up and caught her And to the side her pinned and fought her When she died down low Soon may the weatherman come To bring the sugar and tea and rum One day when the tongue is done We'll take our leave and go Anyway, um... I asked Dr. Damon Salesa to tell me a bit more about Pacific whaling in the 19th century. He's the Dean of Pacific Studies at the University of Auckland. So it's driven by kind of urbanisation. So that whale oil is lighting the streets of New York and Boston. And behind that sits this whaling industry where the energy is literally the flesh and the oil of whales. The whaling industry is massive in the Pacific. It's one of the largest industries we see in the Pacific at the time, and it peaks in the 1830s and 1840s when there's like 15,000 Americans employed in the whaling, by the whaling industry in the Pacific. Places like Martha's Vineyard, New Bedford, those places uh, are built on the backs of Pacific whales and of the labour in the Pacific whaling industry, many of whom are Pacific people. Most whale ships would have freedmen, African Americans have been freed, um, they would have Pacific people, and they would often have Native Americans. And I guess for Pacific people, the other really big impact and the most enduring impact is that the whale ships return to Pacific bases to replenish their supplies, particularly of food and firewood, which they roar through. And so a whole series of ports in the Pacific boom because of the whale trade. Um, probably the largest is Honolulu, and then there's Ovalau in, um, in Fiji, and then Apia in Samoa, but also ones further afield, including Papaiti, and then, of course, Kororareka, which is now known as Russell in New Zealand. 
what happens is those port towns boom and become places where the outside world is brought inside the Pacific. These relationships were often mutually beneficial, but they could also be incredibly disruptive, because when these whalers came on shore after months at sea, they were keen to cut loose, like missionaries nicknamed Kororarika the hellhole of the Pacific. One called John Dunmore Lang described the people living there as the veriest scum of civilised society. Another called William Colenso said Kororarika was notorious for containing a greater number of rogues than any other spot of equal size in the universe. Māori leaders eventually got so concerned about all the chaos that they asked the British Empire to send an official to impose order and sign a treaty. That official was called William Hobson, and that treaty was the Treaty of Waitangi. It was at least partly intended to bring these unruly whalers under control. Anyway, let's get back to our black sheep. Like Dr Damon Salesa said, Pacific whaling peaked in the 1830s and 40s, but the boom couldn't last. Scott Hamilton. By the 1860s, the whaling trade was in absolute crisis. And it was getting harder and harder to find whales. And these beautiful creatures had been hunted almost to extinction. Whalers were desperate and they were looking for other sources of income. And they tried different things. Something I've been researching lately, I've just written for North and South about it, is is the role that American whalers played in the New Zealand wars. Because there's quite a number of them who were selling guns to Maori during the wars of the 1860s. This was a way of making money because they weren't catching whales. So against this backdrop in December 1861, Thomas McGrath set sail from Hobart aboard a ship called the Grecian. He was 47 years old, a whaling veteran. But no amount of skill and experience could change reality. The whales were all but gone. McGrath searched for a full year and only managed to catch four. And finding whales wasn't McGrath's only headache. He also had problems with his crew. On April 21st, six of them had been clapped in irons for refusing to follow orders. On the 9th of June, the rebellion spread. Fifteen refused to work and were shackled below decks for 24 hours in punishment. When he finally landed in Wellington to sell the oil from his small catch on January 5th, 1863, many of the men deserted. McGrath was in a tough spot. As captain, he wasn't paid in wages. Instead, he earned an 11th share of whatever he caught. And increasingly, he wasn't catching anything. But somewhere along his trip, McGrath heard about a different way of making money. We don't know exactly how or when, but at some point in his year-long search for whales he crossed paths with someone who shared some interesting news from Peru. Peru uh, made it known that they were amenable to receiving uh, Pacific Islanders as slaves. Wealthy Peruvians had used African slave labour up until the 1850s, when slavery was outlawed in Peru. It was part of a global movement to abolish slavery. It had been outlawed by Britain in 1833 and by France in 1848. But the demand for slave labour in Peru hadn't gone anywhere. So you've got people who want uh, work for plantations, you've got people who want work for mines in the countryside, but you've also got the elite in Lima who want uh, domestic servants. They want people to be uh, houseboys, nannies, all these things. And the African slave trade is cut off. It's actually um, abolished in the late 1850s. And this is a very sensitive time in relation to slavery. It wasn't the sort of time when you necessarily want to be advertising yourself as a a slaving nation. Eighteen sixty two was right in the middle of the American Civil War, a war chiefly driven by President Abraham Lincoln's efforts to end slavery in the southern United States. The big imperial powers like Britain and France had also become staunchly anti slavery over the last few decades. So Peru's elites desperately wanted slave labour, but they also desperately wanted to avoid conflict with powerful anti-slavery nations. 
So they came up with a scheme to get Pacific Islanders to come to Peru to work for free. But it wasn't slavery. No, no, of course not. It was um, voluntary indentured labour. So Peru created this, like you say, it's a shell game. Um, the idea is you sign up, mate, you become a colonist for three years. We won't pay you for those three years. Um, we'll work you half to death, but after that you're free to do what you want. Now, in reality, uh, virtually none of the 3,500 Pacific Islanders who were taken as captives, virtually none of them signed a contract. I mean, they weren't in a position to sign a contract because they didn't read Spanish. And they were generally abducted by trickery or by brute force. And then they were brought to uh, Callao, the uh, port of Lima, uh, which became known uh, to Pacific Islanders uh, as the jaws of hell. The majority of Peru's slave trade involved Peruvian ship captains who targeted eastern Polynesia, particularly Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, where a fleet of slavers eventually kidnapped about half the population, more than 1,400 people. But the trade also involved men like Thomas McGrath, opportunistic whalers who saw the Peruvian slave trade as a chance for a quick buck. But McGrath was short-handed after so many of his crew abandoned ship in Wellington. So before going looking for victims, he made a pit stop. McGrath was very familiar with the Chatham Islands. It was almost a second home for him. He often used it as a base. And and many other whalers also used the Chathams. Uh, According to both uh, Palangi written sources and the oral history of the Tongans, he recruited a number of Maori. So it's a, it's, a, it's a multicultural slaving fleet. But not all of the Grecians' crew were willing to become slavers. The most vocally opposed was a guy called John Turner. I mean, McGrath actually put it to the crew when they were floating uh, in the seas between New Zealand and the Kermadex in the early 1863. He said, look, we're not catching any whales. Let's start catching some human beings. What do you think, guys? Should we go slaving? And most of the crew agreed. But there was this group of dissidents led by Turner, And McGrath said, right, well, you'll have to get off the ship. He then took him to Samoa and dumped him there. Having disposed of these malcontents, Thomas McGrath now had to pick a target. And this was a tricky choice. It had to be well out of sight of the imperial powers. Britain and France, like we said, had outlawed slavery, and the United States was, well, should we say they were settling the issue. And all of their navies were happy to sink slave ships if they caught them. But McGrath had decades of experience sailing the Pacific, and he had a good idea of the best place to target. Tonga. Dr. Damon Salesa. Tonga is a really interesting place, as many people know. It's one of the few places in the world, and the only one in the Pacific, that is never formally made a part of a European or American empire. And so part of the reason that happens is that uh, particularly capable and in some ways quite brilliant, a young chief becomes the first Tongan king by uniting the three main chiefly titles in Tonga and then adopting the forms, the kind of outward forms of a European monarchy, which then allows Tonga to assert its kind of sovereignty within its borders. So that process, which you know, sort of begins in the 1840s, continues through um, until in the 1870s, and 1875, he actually um, develops and puts forward a Tongan constitution, which is the constitution that Tonga still has. So it's this unique story within the Pacific of not just a monarchy, but actually a monarchy that survives as the sovereign power to the present. Because Tonga wasn't part of a colonial empire, imperial law didn't apply. That meant McGrath could carry out his slave raid without facing any legal penalty when he got back to port in New Zealand or Australia. But even in Tonga, McGrath had to be careful. Another slave ship had already met a sticky end after it tried to raid one of the more heavily populated islands, Scott Hamilton. The word was getting around about these Peruvian raids. A, uh, I think a Spanish vessel, the Margarita, attempted to raid an island in the Harpai group, which is uh, in central Tonga. And the islanders understood what these visitors were up to. And they were actually able to trick the slavers. 
they uh, pretended to acquiesce and they went on board and then they seized the ship, they took it over and they killed the slavers, they sank the ship and they salvaged a couple of cannons. Those cannons are now on display outside the Wesleyan Church and this is a, a story which is cherished by people on the island. Um, I met a Tongan man who had a, a son and he named him Cannon. Uh, <laughs> to, to celebrate the defeat of these nasty slavers. So the fate of, of, of these slavers in Harpai, I mean, perhaps shows us what was in store in the more populated and the better connected parts of Tonga for McGrath if he was foolish enough to go there. So McGrath knew he had to pick on the fringes of the Tongan kingdom, and the first place he chose was Ata. Ata's a very isolated island. Uh, Tupo I, Ata had not been subdued by him as late as the 1850s. The fact that he hadn't um, consolidated his rule over Ata that late, um, it really indicates that the island was remote. And although they were regularly visited by whaling ships, it's not clear whether they had very good um, information about what was going on in the outside world. The people of Atta probably had no reason to suspect McGrath was a slaver. News of slave raids in other parts of the Pacific probably hadn't reached them when his ship arrived on their coast in the first week of June, 1863. The Uttons climbed down the steep cliffs which surrounded their island and picked their way down to the edge of the rocky reef. McGrath yelled out he'd come to trade. He had treasures below deck and a feast to share. About 150 men, women and children dived into the sea and swam out to the Grecian. Probably many of them had chickens or pigs or coconuts held under their arms, hoping to trade with the whalers. They climbed aboard and walked down below deck, where the ship's cook had laid out a meal for them. And the food was probably exotic. I think that on whalers like the Grecian, often rice was a, a, a common food. They were enjoying their meal and then the hatches snap down and they begin to wail and they begin to cry and they, they can see uh, through gaps in the woodwork that their, their island, their beloved home, is disappearing. And he sailed away with half of a people. And Thomas McGrath wasn't done. He sailed up to another island in the far north of Tonga, Niwa Fo'o, and he seems to have targeted it for the same reason he targeted Ata. A very remote place, and the uh, central authorities, uh, Tupo I, down in Tongatapu, they'd imposed some quite serious taxes on the island. It was a struggle for the islanders to pay these taxes, to pay this tribute to this faraway king. And Peter Surin, a German Tongan scholar uh, who's looked closely at Niwa Fo'o, he believes that the islanders would have been um, quite attracted to the possibility of, of, of escape. Uh, the oral history that he's collected is that the islanders were offered uh, contracts to work in Fiji by McGrath and that they jumped at this opportunity and boarded the boat. And once they were aboard, uh, it was all too late. They were put in a hold uh, along with the Artans. They were in chains and they were en route to Peru. But McGrath didn't make it as far as Peru. On his way there, he met another slave ship, the General Prim, and sold the Tongans to its captain. A few months later, a British diplomat watched the General Prim arrive at port in Lima, the place Pacific Islanders called the Gateway to Hell. He recorded 174 Pacific Islanders leaving the ship. 101 male, 73 female. There were no notes on ages, but probably at least some of them were children. From this point on, it's very difficult to track what happened to the people McGrath kidnapped from Ata and Niafo'u. Most of them were probably dead before the year was over, just like the other people stolen as part of this trade. <laughs> 
there's a there's a sort of written record of this in the um, in the Peruvian newspapers, and you can see quite soon that um, the Peruvian elite is is absolutely disillusioned with Pacific Island labour. They complain that these workers die like flies, that they're afflicted by hopelessness, that they have no energy, that they're depressed, that they lie down and wait to die. And uh, those who didn't die of hopelessness uh, died of disease. Diseases raged through the warehouses where the slaves were kept. Um, the Artans, many of them probably never left a warehouse in Kiao. They probably died there. Of the estimated 3,634 people taken to Peru in 1862 and 1863 as part of the specific slave trade, it's thought about 2,000 died. That's an amazing amount of death and suffering, given this trade only lasted less than two years. Dr. Damon Salesa. It came into place, um, this slave trade, which... Peruvians didn't think was a slave trade initially because they saw it as a system of indenture, that is kind of contracted labour. But then it became clear that the new form of labour recruitment, indenture, was as bad as the old form, slavery, which had been outlawed a decade before in Peru. And so all sorts of outside players, including France in particular, (laughs) intervened and other events in, in South America helped structure people's opinions on it which meant that almost as quickly as it came in, it ended. So really, not even quite two years, I believe, um, it was in place, but enough to to inflict this amazing and terrible pain on thousands of Pacific people. So the Peruvian slave trade was abolished, but that wasn't the end of the suffering for the people who'd been abducted. The uh, former slaves... um had to be repatriated and the Peruvian government had the brilliant idea of using the slave raiders to repatriate the former slaves and of course the slave raiders tended to just take the former slaves, many of whom were sick and and dying and and either dump them at sea or dump them on on a convenient island. At least one of the Tongans Thomas McGrath captured survived to be shipped out from Lima. He still has descendants on Rapaiti, one of the islands of French Polynesia. So there were a group of um, nine very diseased uh, former slaves who were dropped on Rapa'iti. Uh, unfortunately, they brought diseases to Rapa'iti, and almost all the male population, the indigenous male population of Rapa'iti, died. So the nine uh, former slaves who, who did survive and who made lives on Rapa'iti, uh, because of the genetic bottleneck, because of the fact that most of the other males on the island were dead, these nine men have many, many descendants. And one of these nine men uh, appears to have been a Tongan, not from Arta, but from near Fo'o. Mm. And I've been in contact recently with uh, people from Rapa'iti. They have a tradition of, of being descended from a Tongan slave, and they're very curious about their Tongan ancestry. So there's possibly a whole other story to be told there. Meanwhile, back in Tonga, you can only imagine the feelings of those left behind, especially in Atta, where half the population vanished onto McGrath's ship. King Tupo I heard about the raid and sent a ship to evacuate the remaining Atans. They were brought to live on the grounds of his palace on Tongatapu. King Tupo uh, just felt that it was, it was reckless to leave the Atans. Uh, on their island. And another factor in his mind may have been King Tupo was was manoeuvring and working very hard to keep Tonga independent and to keep foreign powers out of Tonga. And Tupo I would have been aware that in a number of other societies, um, the depredations of of, uh, rogue Westerners had been used as a justification for colonisation. Dr Damon Salesa. Is a very imperial concept of protection, you know, which looks a little like the kind of mafia's concept of protection, hmm. where you kind of step in to protect people, and in order to access whatever that protection means, um, you have to give up control and power and resource. And you know, I mean, this is where Thomas McGrath is one of these many people who are not only objectionable to Pacific people, but are seen in much the same way by the kind of moral and middle class, um, ordinary persons of Britain and France and the US. And those people come to call these people white savages. 
that is one of the reasons that we see some imperial expansion in the Pacific, not just because of the geopolitical drives of empires, not just because they want Pacific resource, they, all that is true, but also because they're concerned about the troubles that this, these white savages, these troublesome white men bring and are prepared to inflict, and therefore the disruption they represent to the imperial narrative that empires are, are supposed to be good. The theme of the British Empire is onward Christian soldiers, it's not you know, let's go make money and screw people over. Hmm. People like Thomas McGrath disrupt that narrative. There's almost a parallel with New Zealand here, isn't there? The sort of concern of out of control Europeans is a part, at least part of why the Treaty of Waitangi is signed. And I guess by 1860, a lot of people in Tonga and elsewhere in the Pacific have sort of seen how that's panned out. Absolutely. You know, and New Zealand is only one of many. You know, Tahiti, which is the one immediately after New Zealand, you know, it's essentially the same story, where one of the catalysts is the misbehaviour of these white troublemakers. Speaking of troublemakers, after meeting up with the General Prim and selling his slaves, McGrath effectively stole the Grecian and sailed down to Rakiura, Stewart Island. Scott Hamilton. He appears to have used some of the money that he received for the slaves to try to set himself up as a smuggler. And this is another occupation that was becoming lucrative in this period in the Pacific. There was no income tax in the 19th century. And one of the ways that the government raised funds, a very important way they raised funds, was in taking um, taking duty for goods entering the country by ship. And liquor, liquor duties were, were a very important source of revenue. And a real trade developed in smuggling liquor uh, from the tropical Pacific to New Zealand. And McGrath appears to have bought large quantities of it in the tropical Pacific and then brought it into New Zealand. There's a little fleet of customs officials, you know, sailing around New Zealand ports trying to intercept these ships. So it was a real game of cat and mouse. So McGrath goes down to Stewart Island, to Rakura, and he sets himself up in a very isolated place on the west coast of the island called Port William. There's a few whalers there, but there aren't many people living there. And he begins to sell this liquor that he's brought down from the tropical Pacific. And he he may have set up some sort of inn on the shore there. And McGrath appears to be intent on keeping the ship and starting a new life down there on this isolated island at the bottom of New Zealand. Unfortunately for McGrath, he started to attract some publicity. Remember the sailors who abandoned the Grecian when they found out McGrath wanted to go slaving? John Turner and his mates? Well, they weren't the only ones to leave the Grecian. After the raid on Atta, the ship's cook, John Bryan, insisted he wanted no further part of slavery. He'd been the one to cook the feast which had helped entice the Artans on board, but now it seems like his conscience caught up with him. He demanded to leave the ship, so McGrath dumped him on one of the islands of Fiji. Eventually, he linked up with John Turner and the other men in Samoa. Together, they raised the alarm about McGrath in a newspaper article which was published in the Melbourne Leader on November 28, 1863. The profitable nature of the infamous practice of kidnapping the natives of the South Sea Islands and carrying them as slaves to Peru has at length proven sufficiently tempting to induce a British subject, an Irishman, sailing from an Australian colony, Tasmania, to dare the dangers associated with the traffic. The article went on to describe McGrath's raid on Atta as witnessed by the cook, John Bryan. The captain there induced a large company of the natives to come on board to trade. And while they were dining on the tween decks, closed the hatches upon them, men, women and children, to the number of about 130, and sailed with them for the Peruvian coast. Within a few weeks, on December 14th, that story was republished in the Southland Times, 
Thomas McGrath must have read it while he was on one of his smuggling trips to Bluff, because two days later he wrote a letter to the editor of the Times, rejecting Turner's accusations, claiming he'd been denounced as a wretch, unworthy the appellation of a man, blackballed and blackguarded, hung, drawn and quartered by the scribbling crew and condemned without benefit of clergy. All this publicity got back to the owners of the Grecian, who must have been wondering what had happened to their ship since McGrath set sail from Hobart two years earlier in 1861. The owners of the Grecian launched a court case against McGrath, accusing him of stealing their ship. Around the same time, a customs officer in Bluff caught McGrath smuggling liquor. He was put on trial in Invercargill in January 1864. And he's utterly shameless at his trial. He denies taking the ship. He denies um, withholding uh, the proceeds of uh, sale of the whale oil from the whales that he caught from his employers. Um, he denies any involvement in smuggling. He denies ever even thinking about slaving. Um, I believe that he's pressed at one stage on Turner's claim that he uh, had Tongans, Tongan captives aboard the ship and he claims that he was moving a group of Tongans on the command of the King of Tonga. And when I read that detail of uh, his, his testimony to a Tongan audience uh, at a public lecture I gave in Nukalofa, um, there were just gasps and, 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 and snorts and, and la you know, sort of bitter laughter. I mean, that the man would be so shameless as to say that he was serving the King of Tonga. And it does seem as though uh, he was not taken seriously by the court. Um, I think there's an account which talks about gusts of laughter going through the courtroom. Um, but he, he appears absolutely unwilling to give an inch. He presents himself as a victim. He presents himself as the wronged party. Um, there's this complete absence of any reflection. According to newspaper reports, McGrath was convicted both for stealing the Grecian and smuggling liquor. He was fined £200. He later spent six months in prison after he failed to pay those fines. But he was never prosecuted for enslaving the people of Ata. Like we said, Tonga was outside the jurisdiction of the colonial justice system. That's why McGrath targeted those islands in the first place. The survivors of the raid never went back to their island. King Tupo I permanently settled the survivors on Ewa, and many of their descendants still live there today. Scott Hamilton collected oral traditions about Atta as part of his research for his book, and some of them are pretty nasty. A common theme is that the Atans were stupid or weak to become victims of McGrath. The girl who, who talked to me, Pessy was her name, the oral history that she'd encountered, was very dark and very harmful. And there were all sorts of myths about the island that were quite injurious to the descendants. And uh, some of the descendants really did feel still like um, second-class citizens of Tonga um, over 150 years after the catastrophe. They still felt stigmatised. Some of the worst stories are about a man called Paola Vehi, who was the Tupo Ata, or the leader of the island, appointed by the King of Tonga. He was the man who negotiated from the shore with the visiting whaler, Thomas McGrath. They shouted backwards and forwards. Now, Paola Vehi stayed on the shore, so he survived the raid. He wasn't taken away. He wasn't subjected to slavery. He stayed in Tonga. Many Tongans believe there is a curse on Paola Vehi's descendants because they believe that Paola Vehi collaborated with Thomas McGrath, the whaler. They believe that he was complicit. They believe that he sold his own people. They believe that he was a Judas. I don't believe that's credible at all. There was no way that McGrath could have been in touch with Vehi. I mean, McGrath was, was far from Arta um, for much of 1863, the year of the raid. And the stigma against Paola Vehi is still felt by his descendants. Kenneth Duai is one of them. His parents moved from Tonga to New Zealand in the late 60s and early 70s, but he never heard the story of his ancestor until he was 25 years old. So in 99, our whole family decided to do a trip back to Tonga, and we ended up on Ewa, where my dad was brought up 
And while we were there, really it was just an, a random comment by one of my dad's cousins, something about the other people. And I remember my dad getting slightly annoyed. Um, and I remember asking my dad, like, you know, what's the Atta Island thing? And I remember him just like not wanting to have a bar of it and sort of just brush it away, walked out of the, the house and stuff. And I remember, to, and then my, but his sister was there, my aunt. So I, I, my aunt started telling us the story about how the people on Atta had been um, stolen, you know, the word in Tonga is kaiha'a, you know, my great-grandfather, who was the one that um, everyone blames uh, organising for their relatives to be stolen from the island. So, yes, can totally understand their sort of animosity towards, well, underlying animosity towards our family. Very, the, the stigma of it sort of carried through by the family still. So, yeah. It's very difficult to get information out about it from my family in particular. Uh, no one really wants to talk about it. Kenneth Duai doesn't share some of his family's wishes to forget Paola Vehi. He just wants to know more of the real story. He helps Scott Hamilton research his book about Atta and Thomas McGrath. And speaking of McGrath, we only have a few fragments about his life after being imprisoned in New Zealand. We know he was released later in 1864 and went back to Stewart Island because there's a newspaper report saying he suffered a severe head wound in a bar fight at Port William in August of that year. After that, he seems to have left New Zealand. There's a newspaper report, a shipping report from the late 1860s, which talks about a McGrath bringing a ship in from Tahiti. There's another article, uh, I think, from 1871 in a Tasmanian newspaper, which talks about um, McGrath, one of McGrath's sons, visiting Tahiti, where his father is gravely ill. The final fragment is McGrath's death certificate, dated 1882. He appears to have relocated to Tahiti. He appears to have um, continued to, to work with boats and he he certainly never faced uh, justice for the slave raids. But the Pacific slave trade didn't die with McGrath. Instead, it evolved. And that's largely thanks to some new laws from the British Parliament. One of the most significant was the 1872 Pacific Islanders Protection Act. This act made British ship owners liable for kidnappings and other crimes outside the borders of the British Empire. Dr Damon Salesa says Parliament also ordered colonial governors to regulate the trade in Pacific labour. But of course it has an effect that the people behind it don't see. That is, once you try and regulate or control something like this, you've essentially recognised it as legitimate, you know, as long as it falls within the bounds of regulation. And that's what happens um, with particularly the Queensland labour trade. It means that the British Navy, which... You know, in the 1860s and early 1870s was trying to interdict and stop it, the British Navy actually becomes an enforcer <laughs> for these labour um, traders. And so instead of attacking the slave ships, they start seeking retribution against the Pacific people who resist them. It turns into that caricature of empire where the Royal Navy rocks up and fires its guns at villages in Vanuatu and the Solomons sort of teach them a lesson for resisting these these labour traders. And a lot of that is because the shakiness of the legal ground. You know, there is a naval captain who actually takes, arrests one of these captains. That captain then sues him in a Sydney court and wins, you know, and actually I think wins compensation, which sort of lowers the appetite of Navy captains to, to resist them. These laws created something called blackbirding. Historians debate the exact nature of blackbirding and how similar it was to straight-up slavery. But as Damon Salesa says, whatever you call it, New Zealand had a role in it. There was transiting of, of trafficked people through New Zealand. There's actually relatively good evidence that some of them had stays and did work here. You know, a whole bunch of... New Zealand businesses had a finger or a fist or a whole arm in this industry. And that ranges from the ship owners of Littleton and Auckland who owned ships who were actively in 
the black birding industry, the New Zealanders who were part of it. Um, there were even Māori and other Pacific people who were engaged in these crews. So it starts at that end, and then it, it's on a sliding scale, which goes all the way down to, I mean, New Zealand's first kind of large-scale industrial venture was the building of the colonial sugar refinery at Birkenhead. That was solely built to process raw sugar that was cut by indentured labourers in Fiji and Queensland. So if you imagine that kind of continuum, you know, there's a whole accounting for that New Zealand's never really undertaken. To bring the story full circle, let's come back to Ata. Nobody's lived there since McGrath's slave raid. King Tupo declared Ata tapu. But more than a hundred years later, in 1965, six Tongan teenagers were shipwrecked on Ata. They'd stolen a boat to escape the boredom of life at a strict Catholic boarding school in Nukualofa. The boys were marooned on Ata for 15 months before finally being rescued by a passing Australian fisherman. Once they got home, they told their story to the ABC as part of a documentary called The Castaways. It's actually a pretty amazing documentary. Um, the film crew took the boys back to Ata so they could reenact their own story of survival. At first, Ata was not kind to us. Our small boat was broken on the rocks and we were cut and bruised when we came ashore. We lived but our fights to stay alive was not yet over. The boys spent days on the rocky shoreline before finally finding a path up through the cliffs to the plateau in the centre of the island. And when they got there, they found what was left of the people of Atta. One day in the jungle, we found the bones of an old man. He must have been one of the last of the old people to die on Atta. We buried his bones and said a prayer for him, and we hoped that he would never share his fate. Those bones weren't the only thing the boys discovered. There were chickens, the descendants of animals which had been kept by the Uttons a hundred years earlier. They also found their old crops, coconuts, pineapples, pawpaw, even a couple of old knives. These resources were all critical to the boys' survival. I actually did ring up one of the castaways, but he couldn't talk to me. It turns out they recently sold the rights to their story to a Hollywood film studio, so they can't go blabbing it to any random podcast producer. But I like to think they felt grateful to the people of Atta, and I hope the people who were stolen or had to abandon those islands would be glad to know that what they left behind helped save those boys' lives a hundred years later. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much to my guests, Dr. Damon Salesa, Scott Hamilton, and Kenneth Duai. For more on this story, I can highly recommend Scott's book, Stolen Island, Searching for Atta. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to hit the follow button on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever podcasting app you use. Also, give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps new people find this show. Also, check out RNZ's other podcasts. One I can recommend is Fragments, which is basically an oral history of the 2011 Christchurch earthquake. It's based on interviews recorded immediately after the disaster. The producers then followed up with many of those same interviewees to hear their reflection on that day 10 years later. You can find Fragments on whatever your podcasting app of choice is, or go to the podcast and series page at rnz.co.nz. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin. Our sound engineer is Mark Chesterman. Our voice actors are Duncan Smith and Adam McCauley.
Ready to pop the question? The jewelers at BlueNile.com have got sparkle down to a science with beautiful lab-grown diamonds worthy of your most brilliant moments. Their lab-grown diamonds are independently graded and guaranteed identical to natural diamonds, and they're ready to ship to your door. Go to BlueNile.com and use promo code LISTEN to get $50 off your purchase of $500 or more. That's code LISTEN at BlueNile.com for $50 off. BlueNile.com, code LISTEN.